Hi, welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm Danny Gregory, and each week I get together with somebody interesting to have a good chin wag, a chat, go deep on some subject to do with creativity, art, life stuff. Uh, some of them are long term friends of mine, and some of them are people who I just like to have as friends. And this seems like a perfectly good excuse to do so. So today, my guest is going to be Najib Tarazi. Najib is a, a, a director of films, videos, and so forth. And uh, he is based in Los Angeles. And I first discovered Najib. I didn't discover him. He was well known before I came along. But um, he made this film called One More Try, which I thought was just brilliant. And it is something we're going to, I'm sure, talk about, which is, uh, and it's something you can watch on Vimeo, I'll give you a link to it. And he's also had his films in South by Southwest Film Festival. Um, and he's just uh, an interesting creative person who I'm dying to talk to. And he also worked at Pixar. He was a technical director there and he worked on things like Toy Story and Toy Story 3 and Monster University and stuff like that. And he has a BA in physics from Harvard, but we won't hold that against him. So yeah, let's chat with Najib and see what's going on. So you went to Harvard, huh? Yeah, I did. I studied physics at Harvard. It's kind of funny. I actually graduated the same year as Damien Chazelle. And... Mm. I also graduated the same year as another director named Isaac Ravi Shankara, who also majored in physics, which I did as well. And he's like this weird, I don't think he likes to think of himself this way, but he's almost like this weird semi doppelganger, like kind of, um, you know, of an ethnicity that people have a hard time pinning down because he's, I think, half Indian um, and half white and uh studied physics and like but then became a music video director and commercial director um and we were literally doing problem sets together or like in the same you know dining hall when we were in college and now we both barely use those skills although i'll say physics is obviously really helpful for animation and all of animation is really helpful for filmmaking and all kinds of art you know they're so intertwined as disciplines, which is something that I have a very hard time getting across to people. Um, they're just so connected. My, my family was always like, we don't get it. Why did you, why did you study physics and then go into Throw animation and then into film? And I'm like, they're so connected. They're all observation based, like heavily, heavily. They're all about like observational curiosity. Um, and and then even just like the concept of, you know, a parabola or, uh, you know, having the distance between like between a character's position as they s slow to a stop or something, you know, like all those things are really, really inter intertwined. So does it get in the way knowing that stuff or thinking about that stuff? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm being creative because, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, how do you know that? How would you know that? How do you know that that would <clears throat> be a problem? Well, I guess because I've recently really fallen in love with animation. I've been working on an animated film of my own. Um, but I also have come to realize that when I first started working on it, I was thinking about all of those things. And then I realized, you know what? Computers can figure that out. And I don't need to really think about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, like, like with so many things that when you're making something, if you get too technical, it bogs you down and you become hyper judgmental about that technical thing, which bleeds into the creative process. So, you know, I think it's like making stuff on a computer in general is um, something I always do, but I also struggle with the ability to undo things, to tweak things, to add another filter, to do another thing, you know, and all those processes that when you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, you don't, you're not dealing with, you're not thinking in those yeah. terms. So I, I find that it's, um, 
it is, it, it's almost like you have to segment it and say, what part of my brain am I supposed to be using at this stage of the process? You know, and if I'm trying to create just something that's kind of loose and joyous, I'll worry about the technical things later on. And, yeah. and so working on this little film of mine, what I've done is I've been learning about the technical parts of it, of how, how to make, um, and how to use the various tools. And I started at the beginning of the film. So as the film progresses, I'm learning more and more stuff. I don't know the film, but it's literally like scene by scene. Like I'm learning more stuff. So by the end of it, I'll be like amazing at it. But, um, so then I'm going true back to like, the beginning again and, and trying to like re tweak all the stuff. But anyway, that's, it's, it's so crude by comparison to what you do, but that's just kind of what I'm into. No, I, I think that's, I think that's the, the norm for films and even for like albums, you know, a lot of artists will talk about how like the last songs that we wrote were the ones where we had really figured out what we were trying to do. And, and those ones were the best. I think with film also, it's like you build all this infrastructure and then by the time you're done, you finally know how it all works. And then you kind of have to throw it away, which I think is sort of part of part of the process. No doubt that all makes sense. Yeah, In terms I mean, of the technical it, stuff. Yeah. Well, I was right. going to say, I find with writing, like I'll sit down, okay, let me just write something and I'll sit down with a blank sheet or a blank doc. And then, um, halfway through it, I suddenly realize what I'm writing about. And when I get to the end, I'll go back and cut off like the first five paragraphs probably because they were the things they were like the, like a cartoon character. That's like, you know, your wheels are turning and then you take off. That was yeah, yeah. a necessary part of it. So similar. Yeah. That's kind of a one more try is about almost. It's like, I saw this great, um, there is this sort of like self-help artist, uh, that goes by the name Liz and Molly on Instagram and actually Molly of Liz and Molly happens to be my neighbor. Um, but they have a little drawing where they're like, people think of success and failure as two separate things. Um, and success and failure are kind of like two different piles of bricks. One of the brick piles is red bricks and one of the piles is blue bricks. And then the sort of punchline is when success and failure are actually uh, part of the same structure. And then they show one wall built with, you know, both sets of bricks. And yeah, I think what I have been trying to wrap my head around with one more try is some people are like, oh, this is about how, um, you know, how many failed attempts need to be gotten through and peeled away in order to reach the success. But actually, I think I really like the idea that all those moments are part of the same moment, part of the same action, you know, like, everything is, um, everything is essential that is happening, including all the falls, and it's all building toward one moment, not like, uh, you know, I don't know, just like all that stuff that gets cut away is part of the whole thing, even if it's not right there, almost like so an actor who like comes up with backstory for themselves, but you don't see it on screen, you know? Yeah. I mean, you'll see it in a, in a drawing where you could see the, the sketches or the, the sketchy lines, or even the, the brush strokes that are kind of lying underneath it, right? The palm, palm beset, yeah. is that what it's called? Um, where you, you're, you're seeing what got it to that place. Um, but only but if you stripped it all away, it would have a different quality to it. Also, it would have a, cause perfection is inhuman, right? So when something, so watching, for instance, those guys on, on their skateboards, they, one assumes do it perfectly. Like when you see the video that they posted, it was always perfect. So you think, okay, that's perfection. That's what they did. Um, but humanity is much more interesting than perfection. And, yeah. much, and, and, you know, we can relate to it differently. So I, I think in general, so much of the creative process, and I think that almost maybe has an historical kind of significance to it, which is artists for so long needed to seem perfect in order to get clients, right? So if, if they were too accessible, too human, then, you know, why would I hire you and pay you all this money? But so, you know, that's why artists, I think, have always hidden their technology 
you know, David Hockney did this whole study about, about the use of lenses in the history of painting. And, um, you know, he says that that was their trade secret. He didn't reveal that, you know? And, uh, I think that that's, I mean, I'm learning through animation. It's so interesting just in the few months that I've been studying this stuff, I am watching a lot of animation and stuff that always blew me away and was almost in, impossible. Like, how is that possible? And then you say, okay, well, there's 10,000 people in the end credits. So obviously you need millions of dollars and, you know, all kinds of studios and stuff like that. But then when you start to understand how the technology works, how the tools work, how much they're capable of doing, you suddenly say it, it both makes it more accessible, but also more amazing too, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny getting, getting back to your question about the technical side of things, kind of getting in the way. I think a huge part of my creative career has been about, so I, when I worked at Pixar, I was valued as a technical person by most people. And so when I left Pixar to become a director, I thought, oh, I can still get people to sort of take me seriously and appreciate my me as an artist through my technical ability. I had like this these weird dueling things, one where I wanted to be very humanist and creative and get away from computers. And then another where like on a practical level, I wanted to sort of extract whatever professional value I could from being seen as a technical person. And I think a huge part of my journey as an artist has been about either becoming so deaf to technology that it's, it's sort of seamlessly incorporated with my work or, um, beginning from a very much deeper inner place of pure expression and just pulling away everything that gets in the way of that. And I think for a lot of people, that's their journey, but what's cool about hearing you talk about the way that you draw is like you, that is such a high priority for you that you're setting up your process so that you're making space for that. And I think there's like a big lesson in that, um, in that prioritization. It's really important. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, want, I wonder how you feel about this, that there are, I'm sure please, times when you have a tool or you see an effect and you think to yourself, how can I apply this in an interesting way? And then the converse, which is, I have an idea. How do I execute that? You know, like which, wh where, do, where does it begin with you in, in, in coming up with a new idea? Um, what a great question. I would say very often I have a sort of crass business instinct so, which is that I, and I think this is true of a lot of technical filmmakers because there's a number of filmmakers who I would say I could, I could rattle off names of people I know who are similar to me, creative, visual, but sort of constantly trying to see a tool and be the first person to do something interesting with it. And that happens a lot. I would say the most recent place where that happened with me is with this new technology called NERFs, neural radiance fields which is basically like a type of 3d scan, um, that's done with AI. And I saw this and I was like, Oh, what could I do with that? I'm pitching on a shoe commercial. Maybe I could use it for the shoe commercial. Maybe it would look cool. How could I, and then something that I've learned over time also is to say, well, the technology itself isn't interesting enough. We have to, there has to be an idea behind it. And not only that, but we have to push it beyond what's even comfortable for the technology itself for, for it to, really be worth watching, but you know that, so that's like an instinct that I've had for a long time. That partly comes from living in Silicon Valley for a little while, like being around that, that kind of thing. And I think the, as a writer, as a, as a creator of videos, that is in, in actual fact in the work that people see from me in the work that I make that sort of resonates the most with people that is never, almost, almost never where it comes from or the kernel. Um, almost always, and not almost always, always, there is something that is trying to be said or trying to be gotten at. And, um, 
And that's what is really the kernel for the thing. But that doesn't stop me from sort of in an ego driven way, trying to be on the cutting edge of stuff and like find a way to use tools. And I think probably there's a little bit of back and forth in my mind. It's funny you mentioned Hockney because I, I did a music video that used a uh, joiner style, you know, his photo collages. I did a music video that uses that technique with video. And in that case, I was definitely motivated by, I think this technique would be interesting in video, so let's try it. But I even think that inside of my interest in doing that, there was a, a strong curiosity about examining, similar to what he's, he's trying to do, examining the way that we see stuff, right. you know, and that's the underlying motivation, um, which is, I think, a more, a, a motivation that's much closer to like trying to understand our experience of life than it is about using toys or tools or, you know, some fancy button. This is kind of why, like, uh, there was a trend in animation for a long time to open up this software called Houdini and take a figure of a human and click the button that turns them into rubber mush. And, you know, people would just bounce rubber bodies up against each other. And I found it, I mean, not to be a hater, but pretty hollow a lot of the time because right. it was literally just a shelf button in Houdini and people just thought it was cool to do physical sims and it didn't feel like it was ever saying anything to me. Um, and yeah. I mean, I try I to think, stay away from that. I think like, you know, I was in advertising for a really long time and we would all, you know, look at directors reels and look at music videos. And a lot of times it was like, Oh, look, there's a cool thing. Like let's figure out how to make a commercial using that. I remember one of the earliest examples was the Michael Jackson video where he used morphing for the first time. And mm. people morphed. I, I don't even remember what the song was, but black and white. Yeah, but that was, I mean, it was early on in sort of digital effects, and it was super powerful. And then really, really quickly, morphing. I mean, a, a few people made commercials using it, and very quickly it was like, don't use morphing. You know, it just became like it, 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 and and it's because it really had no. Um, that song had emotional had an emotional reason for using it. It wasn't just. A lot of times you'll see music videos where you go, what has this really got to do with the song? It's kind of cool, but what was the song again? You know, but I think when you apply, you know, a technology to, and I think that that's the case with, with your, with your video is, um, that it's really making a larger point. Uh, you know, when I watched that's it, I, I thought for a second, like, how did he do this? Is like, what is this exactly? But then you get past that and you start to think about what's the idea behind it and what is it saying about, about people. And I think that's always, that's always the case with art that, and, and I think with Hockney, you know, he's interested in, um, using technology in, in part, he's talking about technology and he's talking about art and usually the big separation there is between art and technology. Most artists seem to think that technology is cheating and they don't want to use it. And all the discussions that are going on about Dolly and, and, and AI in general now is like tied into that whole thing. Instead of saying like, here's the most incredible tool. How do we use it? Instead, there's discussions about, well, you know, art is dead, you know, which is of course what people were discussing, right. you know, in the, in the 19th century when photography came out, um, you know, and, and he's saying really, he's always interested in how we see. And, you know, not just objectivity, but also what is the subjective nature of seeing, you know, how are we processing what we're seeing and what does that say about us totally. and what, you know, so anyway, those are Yeah. You know, part <laughs> of the reason why I'm so attached to your whole project is because one of the, one of my biggest influences at Pixar was a storyboard artist named Nick Sung, um, he worked on Up and Nude and Cars 2 and, you know, a bunch of different films there. Um, and Nick is and was an excellent uh, draftsman, great at making drawings. And he also was really in love with Bob Irwin. And, you know, he, he, he introduced me to Bob Irwin and David Hockney and... Um, all these people for whom the subjective experience of seeing, he, he pulled a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places, even while he was 
doing all the meat and potatoes stuff about shapes and you know what was his role and like he was a storyboard artist it was a full-time do you are you familiar with how that process works at pixar i no. i mean i know obviously i know it from advertising and i know from filmmaking in general right but I, yeah but how is it different there so basically um the structure there at least when i was there is there's uh director and writer who are working on the story at the script level and then what they're constantly doing is as script pages get written they parcel them out to a team of storyboard artists and those storyboard board artists are responsible for um translating the script into drawings you know um so it could be like a three minute scene they'll stage all the shots and the micro reactions that the characters might have and and that sort of thing i mean they're really like co-directors almost i was gonna say that it sounds like I mean, particularly setting up the shot, you know, you don't want to just say like interior kitchen, man sitting at table. The right. shot is, is what it's all about. I, I assume, I, from my experience of directors, that's what the director does. The director yeah, is. it's just such a workload. Miyazaki famously storyboards his own films, but oh, that yeah. is unheard of in the world of American animation. Um, it's a Why colossal is it they can't workload. Draw? Is it because they can't draw or... No, they can draw. I mean, Pete Docter is an excellent, you know, artist. His drawings are full of life and they're funny and interesting. It's just, there's too much to do, basically. And I think in the early parts of the film, they might storyboard some of it, but it's, um, it's a huge amount of work and it, it gets translated through so many steps because then it'll go into the computer and then, you know, the 3D layout artists might restage the shots or try 10 different ways of staging them. And, um, so yeah, but it's, it's, I would say when I was there, I wanted to be a storyboard artist because it felt like the closest thing to being a real filmmaker and to being really sort of a part of Pixar's process. Um, depend, you know, that's a personal taste thing. Everybody feels differently about that. Because yeah, well, I have but a Nick friend who's an animator at Pixar and she, she was an animator at Pixar and she, the things that she would describe would be like spending months on basically like a. 15 second sequence yes. it wasn't it didn't yeah. feel like being a director it felt like being you know responsible for one scene in a way that most movies don't there isn't a person who's responsible for one shot and that's an entire thing uh it just right. it didn't feel to me as rewarding as what you're describing with being the storyboard artist where essentially you are telling your version of the story in a lot of important ways you're the you're the dp you're the actor you're um you know the the scene, the set builder, the art And the art editor director. even, I mean, yeah, because the way that they'll then pitch their sequences is they, you know, they've been on their Cintiqs all night, done all their drawings, and then the director does walkthroughs and they perform their storyboards and tap through, you know, from one to the next, um, you know, almost playing the edit in front of them while they say, and then this character says this and that character says that. And it's very... Uh, it's really special. I mean, it's one of the most special things that happens there, in my opinion. Uh, the first film I ever worked on was Toy Story 3, and they would do this thing where they put up reels, which is just, you know, an hour and a half of the storyboards cut together with music and scratch voices. And at some point, I remember watching one of those sets of reels, and I was like, you could put this out into the world. Like, this is... I, I cry as much at this ending as I will at the, at the real thing. And I'm laughing just as hard as I will at the real thing. You know, it can feel that way. And then, I mean, honestly, I feel like you would connect to that a lot because all the CG animation just feels kind of like, starts to feel like a lot happens. Like the animation does wind up making it very funny and, you know, micro performance stuff does definitely do a lot, but in terms of getting a story, there's just so much magic in those drawings. And honestly, I feel like the story artists also don't get hired for the quality of their draftsmanship. They get hired for the amount of magic and life and character that's in, in some cases, their chicken scratch, you know, sort of like crude style that they have dialed in to just have, just be chock full of character. You know, that's kind of... Yeah, I mean, I, there's that of sort of on. classic things I remember of Walt Disney with the walls full of storyboard frames and him going yeah. around and telling the story and his, he embodies them and he's, and he think, 
it, is that necessary? And you know, if I looked at each of the individual frames, am I still going to get the story or do I need him to do it? But from what you're describing, it's like a great storyboard artist. The storyboard is, is, is a rough cut of the film in a way, right? Or, or yeah. Low res yeah, version it is. And it, it gives people, um, it, it goes back to that idea of feeling, you know, it gives people a feeling to go for if it's done, done properly. Um, so that even when the animator is going in to animate the shot, they're going to want to add their own, you know, creative input to it, but they have a texture that has been modeled. That's like a starting point. And are there, but, um... uh, the more I be, be, the more I work in creative fields, the more I realize that that's like the most important thing is really nailing down the, the texture. Yeah, I remember. I remember once getting. Uh, I knew a guy who was. He worked on lighting at Pixar, um, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, and he was working on. There was a Rapunzel movie. I forget what it was called. That's Tangled. Yeah, that was Tangled. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he he told me that um, I was visiting LA, and he said, "Oh, you know, come down. I'll you know walk you around and show you the stuff." And um, as it turned out, like the the servers had crashed that day. So like, this is about 10 years ago when I guess the right, yeah. a different situation. So he was like, yeah, everybody got sent home, but come and I'll show you around. And, and he showed me this wall and had all these paintings by Fragonard, I think it was, but there were all these sort of very specific art references. And, uh, and I thought that's just amazing to me like that, that, kind of mood board thing goes into it. Um, the, the feelings of, you know, and just the, the samples of stuff that they were showing And So when, if, if I have a script, if I'm a storyboard artist and you hand me a script, are there also, um, has somebody like figured out like what the kitchen looks like and how it's laid out? And yeah, there's, so, there's a, there's a production designer kind of working on that in parallel. Um, so I'm not and, just sitting down figuring out a kitchen. There, like, there is a, a kitchen. No, but a... yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a design stage happening in parallel with the storyboards. But yeah, they they'll they'll change things around how they need to. And the characters, to, of course, also get the story. Yes, yeah, exactly. All that stuff. They're concept artists doing concept art, and the storyboard artists are really the people walking into those sets and saying, "Where where's everybody going to be? Who's going to jump on the bed? Who's going to?" hang from the chandelier, you know, that kind of stuff. So you couldn't draw when you got there, right? No, I couldn't. Yeah. So I, like I still well, have yeah. a lot. I can tell I can tell you about that journey if you want, but I, uh, I got there and I was a physics major from Harvard and you barely right out a of school? computer scientist. Are you right out of school? Right out of school. I was 21. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 21 already bald. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> and how did you get how did you uh, how did you go from Harvard to to Pixar? That just doesn't seem like it's not a feeder so, school, from what I know. Yeah, it's not exactly. There were I think there were only like three or two or three Harvard alums there when I got there, so very few, um, out of twelve hundred people or whatever. But Pixar did go recruit at Harvard. They would do like an East Coast recruiting trip. There were a lot of Brown really? alums there, and. Um, they came to a career fair when I was a junior, maybe, I think. And I went to their presentation. It was on Finding Nemo and how they had done the ocean and like the, the elements of surge and swell and the light and the particles <laughs> in the ocean. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> um, I want to do this for my life. So I, I, Went home, I downloaded Maya, I started doing tutorials on the internet. I was in no way like equipped to learn all that stuff. I went to a computer graphics professor and I said, I really want to do this sort of thing. And he said, well, you, that's not gonna be your angle. Your angle is you're a physicist. You have to go learn the math of computer graphics and read science papers on computer graphics. So I, I know I changed gears. He was right, to be honest, he was right. I changed gears. I started reading all these papers. I took his class. I became like a tech head for um, that sort of thing. And my, my final project in his class was uh, I rendered a pane of glass and water droplets running down it. And that, but it was a very technical execution of that. But the next year, Pixar came around to the career fair again. They 
I sent in my resume and my material and did not get an interview. So I went to their career fair presentation and I walked up to them afterwards with another copy of my uh, resume and my cover letter. And I said, you guys made a mistake. Like I'm, I'm perfect for this. You should, I, I really think you should interview me for this job. <laughs> and they did. And I got, got the job. Um, one more try, you know, <laughs> all the way. Uh, and then I went there and I stayed there for four years, but they hire physics-y, math-y people because they have problems that re require knowledge of that stuff. Basically. It's like if I have a, you know, a ball and I have a light over here and the light is shining on the ball. You have to, you, you use math to compute how bright each pixel is going to be. You know, it's like that sort of stuff ad nauseum. Um, one of my first things that I had to solve, which was very hard. And I, I, I think I barely did is the piggy bank character in toy story three has these four legs. Um, that are supposed to, he's supposed to be made of porcelain or something. And, and the legs are supposed to smoothly, uh, integrate with his body, even though they're moving all around his body. And I had to figure out the math for like exactly how the bevel of his, his leg would intersect with his body. You know, that was the kind of thing I would spend three months on. I mean, that's what I remember from that movie. I was like, God, <laughs> the pig's armpits are unbelievable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, no surprise that, I'm doing that. And then I'm seeing my friends who are working on the storyboard artist stuff who are just taking script pages and turning them into drawings. And I say, Oh, I have to learn to draw. That's what is valued here. And that's the most important part of the process. That's what I value here. I guess I won't speak for the whole company, but, um, so I, I was lucky cause the company would do Tuesday and Thursday lunchtime gesture drawing classes with basically 30 second, one minute, two minute poses. And you could do it for, I think it was like 45 minutes or something like that. So it was a solid class and the story artists would attend and teach. So you could really get a good education. So, or not a good education, but some kind of education. So I would do those every Tuesday and Thursday. And then morning and night, I would go to a cafe, sketch people at the cafe, sketch on the commute, take the sketch classes in the middle of the day, sketch on the commute home, try to sketch in the evening too. I started drinking coffee. I was not a coffee drinker. I started drinking coffee because I was copying anatomy out of a textbook. I remember it was like the femur. I was learning the femur and thigh section and I was falling asleep at my drafting table. I was like, I need something to help me with doing these, this stuff. It was harder than, harder than Harvard then, I guess, in that regard. It is harder. And uh, uh, I mean, depending on, you know, what your inclinations are, it's very hard. And I think what was also challenging about it is the story artists. And I, there's, I think there's a big lesson in this for everybody who follows you. The story artists, I would do a drawing and it would be sort of like lifeless and cardboardy to me and it, it, it would have nothing going on. And then a story artist would come over and say, oh, just do this. And then they would in five seconds make adjustments to my drawings that would bring them to life. And I could never imitate what they were doing. It was happening right in front of me. And I was so perplexed because like I'm watching them do it. And I, and, and, and I slowly learned that they were hiding hundreds of tricks that they had learned from their drawing experience right before my eyes. And this is kind of what it's like when you're watching anyone who does something well, right. do it. You know, they have millions of failures to learn from and and they have found their ways to sort of encode things. And the moment that I remember the most clearly is um, there's a drawing of a character looking in a direction at someone. And my friend, Alex Wu, who's a story, who was a story artist at the time to draw the pupil, instead of drawing a point, he drew a little arrow shape. And I realized, oh my gosh, he, the, the pupil was in profile. I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is in two strokes mimicking the curvature of the eyeball yes, looking yeah. in a direction. And I was like, you need to teach me that. 
you know, just like, did. Like, cause, cause the, yeah, he just did. It's true. <laughs> it's true. But it was, but I was like, how many other little things am I not noticing inside of this? And as I drew more and more and more and more, I mean, just four years of almost driving myself crazy. I mean, at times it was painful to draw something and then to be frustrated with how it was turning out. And then I think I finally had a breakthrough. I went on this trip to Europe by myself and was just drawing the whole time. And finally I got so fed up with my own frustration about the whole thing and judging myself for not being enough of an artist or enough of a creative person or whatever. Cause all these thoughts were kind of going on. I finally was like, I'm just going to do whatever I want now. I'm just going to draw whatever I want, however I want. And the second I did that, all of the knowledge of anatomy and all the lessons and all the hours and stuff sort of just started to synthesize with my own personal expression. And I stopped trying to draw like a Disney storyboard artist and sort of allowed myself to just be myself. And especially having gone to Harvard and like being in the academic world for so long, I'm so used to trying to replicate some standard of excellence, you know, and getting away from that is like so critical. Um, it's just so, so important. I, I had a friend in San Francisco named Sadie Schaefer who had shown me sketchbooks of hers that she had just sort of been doing. She was a student at MIT at the time and she, she would draw and they just seemed so driven by her like personal expression or whatever. It wasn't trying to imitate something else. It was just amazingly her. And, you know, I know that blind contour drawing, and I know that there are like different ways that people try to break out of that stuff and get closer to themselves. But I think that, you know, there are many different scales of people's drawing journeys. You know, there's the day to day, and then there's the week to week and the month to month and the year to year and the lifetime. And, um, I like yeah, that. I like but that. I don't I draw like very much anymore. I like yeah. that perspective. I mean, I think, I think going back to what we were talking about before about your, your physics training is I think that there's, there's a sense a lot of people have when they come to drawing, that there's a way to do, to draw, that there's a way to draw and there's a way to draw things. So even like what you were talking about, learning those shortcuts or um, tricks about drawing. And, you know, I think there's a gazillion people on YouTube right now watching drawing tutorials, how to draw a face, how to draw a hand, how to draw a horse. And maybe step-by-step step you can learn to follow those steps and end up with the result that that person in the video made. But I think that's, and that's why you end up also seeing so many people who draw like manga, you know, they're drawing like, I, I've learned the manga way of drawing an eye, drawing a nose, drawing hair. You've learned that, that um, architecture, that vocabulary, but going back to physics. And I think that there's of course laws of physics and ways of doing things, but then you look at someone like Feynman and you think, you know, Feynman was, he was able to make quantum leaps because he was being playful and he was expressing his personality that led him to creative solutions. And you wouldn't think that that would necessarily be a thing in physics. You would think, well, it's just about, you know, some kind of, process of following rules and, and building upon the rules of others. Um, but in fact, it's a creative act as is so much of science. Um, you learn the fundamentals, you internalize them, like you've said, and then you suddenly make quantum leaps by relaxing, by relaxing, yeah, just doing it. You know, I, I loved your video that you made with one more try where you talked about the sardine, um, for that reason, cause it's, it's in the same theme, I think. Yeah. I mean, I encounter that a lot of people say, or, or people will say, well, it happened today. Today I was doing uh, drawing an owl and um, I was using a dip pen and this person wanted to really know like what exact nib did you use? And then obviously it was like on Google while I was doing it saying, well, there's different kinds of versions of the same nib that you describe. And I had to say, it doesn't really matter. Like you could use a sharpened, use a nail. You could use a sharpened stick. It, that's not the point. It's, using my nib isn't going to get you to draw like me. You know, um, it's, yeah. it, it is, it is, it isn't to say that there's a secret to it. It's just ultimately about 
trust and self-expression. Um, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. It just sure. as somebody who is in a position of like sort of teaching people and you know, you're in this like instructional sort of, sort role, of teaching them in sort the of, or, or inspirational. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think you're just in an interesting position um, because you do, I think, do a nice job of balancing this component of like personal expression and modeling something for other people. And then that also means that your personal expression is sort of on display or like, you know, maybe it doesn't feel that way because you're a professional, but disastrously um, often. Yes. It's often. Yeah. Disastrous. I'm just curious to hear your reflections on that. Yeah. No, it's, um, I've come up with a bunch of excuses for when I fail, um, because I'm failing again, like, like a skateboarder, I'm failing in a really dramatic public way. You know, there's nothing like sitting on YouTube doing a drawing and it sucks, you know, and it's partly because I'm balancing a lot of different things while I'm doing it. And it's, it is hard to get into a flow state when you're, you know, you have a mixing board on one side of you and you're watching your, you know, your internet connection and things like that going on. Um, you know, but I think what I, what I want to say to people is, um, aided failures is okay, but also that a lot of times when I see the drawings that people have done in a class, in a thing that I've, you know, I'll draw the, the sardines and then other people, I see other people's sardines and like, they're way better than mine are. And I think, well, I'm sort of in an authority position because I'm, a guy on the screen, but then they're doing a much better job of it than me. But my job isn't really to do a better drawing than them. My job is to say, it's okay to do a shitty drawing because if you do one that's bad, then eventually you will get to do a good one. But if you're so terrified of doing a bad one, then, you know, what are you going to do? And if you and and I think about someone like Bob Ross, like Bob Ross never did a shitty one. You know, he was always like, it was always Bob Ross level, but then you find out that, you know what, he actually always did three paintings each time and he did one in advance. And then he did like another one at some other point. So he was seemingly effortlessly just doing it, but actually he was practicing. And, um, you know, the process to me, the process of doing it, enjoying it, make, having fun while you're doing it, learning stuff, going to places you haven't gone before. That's really what it's about. Not about whether it's good in the end. Uh, and the more that you focus on that process, um, I think the more it will be a good experience, which is probably the most important part of it, but also it'll probably end up being a better piece than if you're constantly worrying about your failures all the way through. That's kind of the way I've, that's my rationalization. I'll also just add that I, I feel like you, something else that you're doing is you're just creating space, even for the person who makes a, an amazing drawing of a sardine to make their amazing drawing. You know, it's like everybody needs that space. And I think having a shared kind of place to do it is, is really cool. Well, I want, yeah. there was one thing that I wanted to mention. I'm going to rewind a little bit, so you should go ahead. Go ahead. Rewind. Well, I was just going to mention, you were asking, you were asking about sort of how technical stuff can get in the way. And I, I wanted to recommend, um, my, friend acquaintance Alex Grigg is a really great animator and he just put up a series of uh, animation tutorials on YouTube oh. that are very good and one of one of the I think it's called animation for anyone or, or something like that um, I should look it up though but one of the critical insights that he makes which I think is true of almost any art making, He's like getting into some of the technical aspects of animation, but he says that he asks himself one question all the time, which is how does this movement feel? And he says that he's just asking himself that question, you know, all the time as he animates. And I was so fascinated to sort of see him put that question all the way up at the front of his animation tutorial, because I've done animation tutorials and I've, I've done technical animation tutorials and how to do CG stuff, but I feel like that question should be at the beginning of every internet tutorial about almost anything. <laughs> it's like, if you're going to figure out how to 3D model a, a toilet or anything, or like whatever it may be, 
you should be asking the question, how does this thing feel? How do I want it to feel? Um, I love you to the person, that to the person looking at it or the person making it. I, he doesn't d distinguish per se. The feel is sort of just like a shared feel. I, I don't think he's talking about the process of making it. He's talking about the, the received experience of, of watching it for sure. Um, but in his case, because, you know, he's watching and rewatching his own work as he animates all the time, um, almost like, you know, scrubbing through the timeline, uh, that's available to him as something to wonder about. So how much do you think that all of the developments that have happened in technology and that seem to be accelerating every day, how are they going to change all of this stuff that we're talking about? Because, because I think, um, on one level, of course, it's making potentially making the tools more accessible to more people, but also I think it's ideally the, the stuff that you were doing to get your first job at Pixar seems like it would be increasingly irrelevant or that it would be mechanized or, or, or that was true. Yeah. Handle, yeah. That, that you I don't think that was need part to of be the reason why I wanted to get out of there was because I realized that the industry was moving toward a place of increasing kind of the, the hard problems have been solved. People would say now I would say with the advent of AI, that's proving to not be the case because, um, many, many new interesting questions are being created, but, I have so many thoughts on this. We should have done the whole session on this. Are we, are we hard capped at an hour? I'm not no, going to. No, no, no. I'd love to hear whatever you have to say. Okay. Man. This is yeah. something that I really wanted to talk about with you actually, because it's so relevant to the world of art creation today. Um, and it honestly, what you were talking about, about sort of unplugging and just being you with a pencil and a paper is at the beginning of this whole conversation is to me like, so core to the way people think about this stuff and should think about this stuff. I have a ton of opinions about AI art. Um, a lot of people will disagree with me on them. Um, I think, first off, I think the most interesting type of art that is going to come out of Dali and all this stuff is in the tradition of Hockney. It's the way you were talking about Hockney. It's going to be the ways that people use that art to examine the way we subjectively see things and even sort of like to blur the idea of our subjective and objective viewing because the AI art is trying to pick apart something about the way we see and not quite putting all the pieces together. It's almost like if you, uh, if you like disassembled a car for a child or something, and then they, put it back together and the steering wheel is in the wrong place. And, you know, it doesn't quite drive, but there's some idea of a car there. That's like what all this stuff looks like. Um, to me, a lot of the time. And I think what I'm most curious about is someone holding up the errors in the art and saying, what is going on with this thing that it's doing wrong? Why is it doing this thing? wrong like that could be so interesting and i'm waiting to see a little more of that and yeah. i think yeah, yeah like I, I, was, I was thinking about that in terms of teeth so when you like i asked um mid journey to do a drawing of a, a ballpoint black a black ballpoint drawing of a smiling woman and it came back with something that was like a sort of a japanese horror film because it had like 80 teeth and they were kind of fibrous and it was, it was a smiling woman, but then it had this really horrifying component to it. And I, you could see like, okay, it's studying teeth and it knows we have a lot of teeth. And, but usually, you know, when you draw teeth, like don't draw the teeth, like just don't, don't, if you focus on the teeth, when you're doing a drawing of teeth, it will be a disaster. But I, I and I kept, and I, every time I did it, it would produce this and it was just, I kept thinking like, what is it, what is it exactly what we're saying? Like, what is it, what are the decisions that it's making? And it's take, it's, it doesn't have the emotional understanding that we don't want teeth. Like you don't, right. they're threatening, they're all kinds of things. And will it come to that? Or like, it doesn't have the kind of animal response to teeth that we do. So I don't know. 
I think this. Yeah, maybe we're seeing all the teeth. Maybe we're seeing teeth all the time and erasing them from our minds. You know, like that could be something that it's about. I, I also think I've seen ad agencies and stuff use AI art, and I think in some cases they think it's cool because it they think it looks good or something. AI art almost never looks good to me because it's intentionless. You know, like it doesn't have. It usually doesn't even have like a good line of action, to be honest. Compositionally, um, yeah, yeah. Compositionally, it, it, it's terrible at uh, having a focal point, designed focal point. I think a lot of the time, because it's just trying to put together ingredients. But so they use this AI art, and I thought what's provocative about this is its existence, not anything contained within the pixels. And so I think the most interesting examinations of it are have to be about that and not really about saying that it's doing something special for art. Yeah, it's because, like the old saw of like, it's amazing that my dog can talk, although he has nothing really interesting to say. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Right, I mean, I, there's a huge, huge element of this in that like, like with any amazing tool or automation, it's just pointless if there isn't real intention behind it. it uh, pointless is a, is a harsh term, but it, po pointless isn't even, that, that's assigning some sort of moral weight to it. I think what I'm really getting at is that um, no one will be drawn to it or curious about it or interested in it if it doesn't have some human intention behind it. And I think it is really interesting and telling that 99.9% .9 of the AI art that I see today um, is expl like people need to tag it as AI art because it's maybe not interesting otherwise, you know? There, there's one exception to this. A friend of mine made some very cool images with Dolly of beached sea creatures on highways on like the 405 at night. Oh my God. It's and horrifying. It's horrifying. It's, it's weird. It's like, you see like dolphins in a parking lot, you know, on the floor of park, but I give her credit because that sounds interesting enough when I just say it aloud and you can summon the imagery into your head because her idea is interesting. It's not right. really the, like I, I could print those words on a piece of paper and put them up in an art gallery or I could take the Dolly generated thing. And what's interesting is that she was interested in that as an image, you know, yeah. it's not really the pixels. I think what you're describing is an issue that I have with people learning to make art. Um, it's like the fundamental problem, I think, which is thinking that how that learning the technical skills is sufficient or is even the objective. And I, there's a, speaking of Hockney, there's this movie, I think it's called looking for Hockney or waiting for Hockney. Do you know, do you, have you ever heard of this film? Not so sure. it's a documentary about this guy who spent seven years on the same drawing. He did this gigantic hyper-realistic pencil drawing of Marilyn Monroe. And he does all these things with like, sharpening these pencils to like incredible microscopic point and going in and doing that. And like, and his goal is he wants to make the greatest drawing that's ever been made. That's what he says. And sure enough, when the drawing is done, it looks exactly like that photograph of Marilyn Monroe. And, but what he has as his plan is that when he's done, he wants to take it to David Hockney and have Hockney sort of sign off on it. Yes, this is the best drawing ever done. So the whole documentary, he's like making this thing and then they box it up and they take it out to Hockney. And for some reason, they don't get a camera to go into Hockney's um, studio, but you, I think they have a mic on or something like that. So you get to hear him talking about it. And basically Hockney like looks at it and is like, yeah, why Marilyn Monroe? Like that's his response to it. <laughs> this guy spent <laughs> seven years on this thing. And right. it's like this point is like, ultimately what art is, is it's a, it's a, a bridge between brains and between hearts and people. Right. Yeah. So, so the technical part of building the bridge is 
okay, like I guess you kind of need it or it's nice, but ultimately it's the link between people that that's the thing. And, and that's, I think what AI is, is reminding us of, which is like making a thing that looks just like a thing. Isn't really the thing, you know, that it's ultimately, um, what can we learn from each other? How can we find commonality? How can I learn from your experience? That's what it's all for, you know? And, yeah. um, my old roommate wrote a great book about this called the most human human that I recommend to everyone. Um, which is about basically how, uh, what technology is doing a lot of the time is it's forcing us to expand or reduce or adjust the definition of what it means to be a person. And I do think that this AI art is like doing a great job of forcing us to churn on all these questions in a fun way. You know, you you can embrace that process. Yeah. I mean, everybody's citing as an example of, you know, how we're at the edge of the precipice is some um, art competition where somebody submitted an oh, AI yeah, yeah. piece. Yeah. And you go, well, that's a, she said it was a pretty lousy competition. I mean, that yeah. does, it doesn't sit, prove anything beyond that. Why were you <laughs> judging it? Why were you giving out prizes for art anyway? And whatever art wins a, an award is rarely anything that you'd want to look at twice anyhow. So if anything, it kind of makes the point more about art competitions than about whether AI right. is replacing us. I think from a technical perspective, I have another thing to add about this, which is when I worked at Pixar, you know, and I was an engineer, I started as an engineer, I started as this Harvard physics grad, and I had not gone to art school. And I didn't understand what artists wanted and needed to make cool movies. I knew a little bit about computer graphics. And so if I came up with an idea that I thought was cool technologically, Sometimes I would go and I would try to write it up, code it. And then I would show it to an artist and they would say, this is not how I create. There are many more problems that are pertinent to my self-expression and my process, how I model a tree, how I paint a sidewalk, you know, to look like a sidewalk, than this weird five-step algorithm that you've come up with that you think is cool because it automates one thing that's not relevant to me. And I see that uh, disease in the AI art community in spades, like nothing tilts me more (laughs) on Twitter for better or for worse than some AI pusher kind of saying we've made the next we're making incredible tools. And it's like, if someone like came to you with like a, a two headed hammer, they're like, look at how fucking cool this two headed hammer is. And you're like, this is dumb. I don't need this two headed hammer just because you could make it. And there's a lot of that in AI and this is going to happen. I mean, people create all kinds of technologies and not all of them wind up being useful. And this is the history of technological development. And that's okay for every hundred tools that people design, you know, only two will stick around or something, but the confidence with which people sort of say, this is the future is interesting because they're mostly giving people very, what I would call like blunt knife technology. You know, it's like stuff that is really cool for a tech demo But if you as an artist have something really specific that you are trying to do or say, you're going to have to carve your own weird version of whatever that tool is in order to get to the place where you're going. And just doing something where I can tell a computer, like if being able to type into my, into a computer prompt, make the footage blue is not interesting just because the computer understands that I want the footage to be blue and then it can make it blue. Even when you're trying to do volume, you know, when you're trying to make a hundred different frames that all, uh, where, where like you might assume that automation would be helpful. The reality is that pretty much anything that you watch and enjoy, like, each frame has been massaged, you know, like there's intention in every little step. It's not always true. I know that there are like cool remixes and weird amalgams of stuff that people make and collages and, 
you know, that's fine. But something that I learned at Pixar is that like every pixel is massaged in every frame. And when I was there and I was a technologist, I thought, oh, anything that I can do to automate this process would be cool and cool technology. But the reality is that's not what anyone wants. What everyone wants is the ability to endow their creation with more of their intention, more effortlessly. And yeah, I, I think technologists just underestimate how much detailed work goes into art. Or how ma much, how many aspects of the person making it have to go in, how closely that person has to hug it and have, you know, this, because again, you could take like a, you know, a Dremel and you could attack a, a block of stone, but you're not going to make David. You know, you're not, you know, it's, it's, it's like that scene in um, the fly when he sends the steak. Do you remember that? He sends the steak. I haven't seen the fly. Okay. So the, the Jeff Goldblum version, he teleports a, f a steak from one place to the other. And he's like, it's a steak. And then he cooks it and he's like, whoa, like this is something about it. Like it's lost. It's something. He can't even explain what it is. And I was thinking about that, that that's. That's sort of what this is. It's sort of, you go like, yeah, the teeth are weird, but, or, or, or that you've seen that thing. Um, this is not a human, that, that website where it's constantly generating people. And you go like, yeah, it looks like a kind of a crappy photograph of a real person, but there's lots of crappy photographs of real people already. Like what, where's that coming? Besides the, the, the thing that we all have, the uncanny Valley thing of there's going to be this stuff that's, that we don't know is fake. We don't know that it's fake. With that particular thing, it's funny because the art of like composites is as old as photography. I mean, people have been doing that, like they were, I think they were doing that in the 1800s or something. And it's not so crazy to come up with a face that is like learned mm -hmm. from other things and not a real person. But, but yeah, I, I also see what you're saying in general, but I love how people are like, whoa, isn't this nuts? And it's like, it's as old as photography. Like it's not. Yeah. That and nuts. I think, I think it's also with AI, like this, these visual examples are such a big deal to us because they're dramatic and they're easily to understood. But the real transformation that AI is going to have is so beyond anything we can imagine. Like we're not, uh, incapable of projecting what it's going to be like. I, I was listening to these, um, this, this guy who works on AI at Tesla and he was talking about how he thinks that this is like first generation AI that we have now, but the third generation will be so beyond human understanding that it won't have any ability. It won't have any interface for humans. Like in other words, it'll be technology that is just kind of like being itself, doing its thing. And we'll have no way of engaging with it because it'll be so beyond us. And its purpose has nothing to do with us. And it's just doing something that we can't even understand. That to me is sort of terrifying in a way, but it's almost like godlike. Like there's just this thing that we're, we're just, we're just monkeys. We don't even, we can't even begin to understand what that's about. Yeah, that's totally plausible. I think a future that people don't talk about enough also is, and, and that I, there's not, there's not a lot of money in put, framing the future this way, but there, you know, there are types of math equations that are kind of unsolvable. And there are problems in physics that are considered kind of unsolvable. Like you can, you can, um, you know, if you're looking at the quantum mechanics of a single particle, it's like the way that physicists describe the physics of particles is they create these really contrived situations where the math works out perfectly. And the number of those that they have is kind of limited because it just turns out that like quantum mechanical fields are super complex. They're so complex that like you can't, it's not that like a super smart person could solve them. It's like literally mathematically, they might be um, uns like unsolvable in a meaningful way. Like that, that I, that idea kind of exists in, in math and physics. In a and, meaningful way, meaningful to us, or just that there isn't a solution or that having a solution wouldn't really build on anything. It's like having a solution would just be this like, crazy tangle of chaotic numbers that you would have to compute and computing it would require more compute power than exists in the universe. I'm sort of, I, I'll, I'll, I'm saying this as a lay person at this point, like 
it's been 15 years since I was in a physics program or whatever, but um, there are definitely sets of problems that it's not, it's not like an unlimited amount of um, human time developing technology can solve every like problem of the mind or of physics and math in the sense of like being able to predict the outcomes of all kinds of my, my point is just that there are physics and math problems that are, and problems of knowledge that are, um, almost by like our universal understanding of the laws of math and physics, not the kind of thing that someday we're going to have a calculator that can just put it in a box. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was thinking <laughs> as you were talking about that, I was saying, thinking to myself, we human beings for most of our existence have assumed that there were powers that were greater than us. Right. Yeah. But for the last century, let's say many of us have sort of assumed that that's not the case, um, that we are, that we are the gods, let's say, and that something about AI and its possibilities that suddenly puts us back down further down the pyramid. Right. So that we're, is exactly. We're, it, yeah. yeah. So, so it's like we're reasoning, realizing our limitations. Now art in the case of AI art, perhaps what we're thinking is, well, it can never, it can never really be what we are. It can never, you know, really uh, re replace our humanity. And so therefore, you know, we're, we're still, at the top of the pyramid there. But, but the reality is it's pulling up past us and it's, it, whatever it is, 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 is going to take us and just make us perhaps more humble, you know, and that might be really yeah. good for us because I think right now we're at a stage in human development that is not particularly great. Um, and and <laughs> we're, 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 we're disengaged from our humanity and our, and our connection with each other in a way that, that feels really dangerous. Um, and maybe, and it's not, it's not as simple as like the, well, if we were invaded by, you know, um, a species from another planet, then we would band together, you know, and we would, cause I don't even think that's probably would be true. I think we've, <laughs> that we, I don't, I don't, can't imagine what it is that pulls us together, but, but maybe we do need, you know, something that kind of diminishes our hubris in some it's way. Counterpoint. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, to, to get back to the, yeah, it makes total sense. And to get back to the point that I was making, I think there's also a world that is not talked about enough, which is that it might be that people, it might be that the concept of being smarter than a person doesn't really exist. And I think just people don't quite discuss this enough. Like there's a possibility that AI shoots up toward being as smart as people and then just keeps asymptotically kind of approaching being as smart as people because the idea of having a more robust general intelligence than people have is like literally um, it starts to become kind of, it could start to become kind of meaningless, you know, like maybe you need to have a body that can move through the physical world to collect certain types of information. Otherwise, if it all just lives on servers, then the servers can't even talk to each other fast enough because of the limits of the physical world. And it's not going to know what's happening in Russia or the Bahamas or, you know, like it, we're, we're this big distribute. Actually, are you an Adam Douglas fan? No, I don't know. Adam. Douglas. Like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Douglas Adams. Sorry. Douglas yeah, Adams. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, the joke of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is that Earth is a computer. You know, it is itself a computer sort of trying to compute the meaning of the universe. And I think that's almost the most apt concept of intelligence as you expand to this idea that we're all like little neurons and stuff. And the AI is just a different flavor of neuron. It's not like some super creature. Um, well, because ultimately, yeah, like can, big can it, the, the question is, can it transcend its creator? Right. That's, that's the fear is that it transcends the creator. Right. And ultimately right now, AI is just feeding off our data. It's the data that we created and brought into it. It's, it's still within that bubble. It's like, it's, it, 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 it can't branch out and, and robotics is really limited now, right? Robotics, robots can't really 
engage with the physical world properly or better than we can. There's so much subtlety to us and the way our bodies and brains work, as you say, so many ways that we're bringing in information. Um, it's just, we're not capable of creating something in, in that, we, that will be able to assimilate all that information um, or that right. will create something in turn. That's what, that's what our other fear is that our creation will create other creations and that those creations will transcend us, right? Right. Um, and these stories are all like really juicy and they're close to religion. I just wonder, you know, and this applies to AR, AI art too. It's like, I wonder at what point, you know, we as a people create colossal amounts of like mush and gruel and, you know, we create all kinds of things that isn't really meant to go anywhere or mean anything. And the things that mean something are usually like either by luck or by some electricity or magic, these little statistical outliers or standouts and whether those are going to come from AI or from us or who knows, I don't know, but I know that everyone is going to be creating a lot of noise <laughs> in the middle of it all. And it's not just going to be like some AI that comes along and uh, is all of a sudden, you know, spouting the word of God, uh, uh, you know, all day, every day that we just have to listen to, you know, but I could be wrong. I think that's a good place to stop. I think, I, <laughs> okay. I think we've, we've, I agree. Our, our conversation has taken us to the outer edges of uh, possibility. So that's good. That's like true. The edge of the twilight zone. All right. Are you still here? <laughs> it was a nice long chat, but uh, Najib is a fascinating person. And I actually am dying to talk to him some more about a bunch of other things. In fact, after we finish recording, he and I kept talking for another half an hour about all kinds of other stuff. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and let me know what you thought. Write to me at podcast at sketchbookschool.com. And um, I'll see you next week with another interesting chat here on Art for All. Thanks for joining me. <laughs>